A uh, couple things, if you notice, we're blue, silver, blue. It reflects the Detroit Lions. We're all from Detroit, so we just thought we'd mention that. But then, I, I do have a problem with Kevin because, you know, Navy SEALs are intimidating enough, but now coming up on stage following a Navy SEAL, it's like, for the audience, it's like going from a high school pep rally to English class. So, you know, we apologize for that, but Kevin, we're gonna discuss order of speakers next time. Okay, so let, let's get right to it. Um, before we get into the future, as far as the iron worker market sector for um, construction, equipment installation, and maintenance, um, how would you rate iron worker performance and safety, quality, timing, et cetera? So Mike, I, I, one of the things that, that I truly believe in, and anybody that knows me, I believe in the building trades. I believe that when I hire building trades, I am going to get highly trained, highly skilled individuals that are gonna perform on my sites and they're gonna perform safety, safely. We had over 13 million labor hours last year with the NMA. My group alone had just over three million. We had one recordable and it was a no right. <laughs> so, you know, when, when you talk about what we, what we do and, and, and the level of risk you face every day, the, the pride that you should all have in your membership is that your people are doing an outstanding job for, for us and Ford Motor Company and del delivering our products on time and safely. Thank you. Gary, do you have anything? Yeah, just a couple of things in the, under safety. Um, your teams have done an outstanding job at both uh, Glendale and Tennessee, and a lot of the things I'll refer to because their current projects are those two projects. Um, from a safety perspective, hit it out of the park from a building perspective where the growing pains are uh, for all of us is the congestion um, in the facilities as we install 9,500 C containers of equipment in each building, uh, which are around 4 million square feet. From a timing perspective, we were pushed pretty hard by Ford leadership on being best in class. And I must say, um, both Glendale and Stanton, our two locations, did a remarkable job with, with timing. Um, in the case of Stanton, 47,000 tons of steel in 250 days. Um, about 12,000 less tons in uh, Kentucky because uh, it's non-seismic versus Tennessee, which uh, <clears throat> was performed in 188 days. And if you normalize for um, just sheer tonnage, both very competitive and oh, by the way, just slightly better than the biggest EV manufacturer in the US. So thank you to your teams for contributing to that. The space we really need to look at <clears throat> from a quality perspective, and Mike will comment on it, is the clean room environment. You all are now helping us in both locations um, with machine install in the factory um, with the containers and equipment that I spoke about. And it's a clean room environment. It's a new challenge for my team and your team in understanding the protocol requirements and, and what it takes to help us commission these facilities and have a fighting chance at good first run. Thank you, Gary. As it relates to now, what can the iron worker craft and employers improve upon? I would say that the, the biggest improvement we could make is make sure you're passing on your trade to your apprentices and your pre-apprentices. Make sure that when you're on the job site, that they are given, given meaningful tasks, right? They don't need to be fire watch. They don't need to be the ground person. You know, they need to have, you know, pass on your trade and train them so that they can become our future workers that, that I can count on on a regular basis. I mean, that's the biggest thing for me, is make sure, because we see so many now, right? So many pre-apprentices and, pre and apprentices that, you know, the average age, I believe, I thought I heard it the other day, was 46 or 47, 40, 47 year old. You know, we're, we're, we're graduating some of these people and there's a big gap that we need to fill, so we need to make sure we're providing the proper training. Thanks, Tony. What about you, Gary? I think the, the space we can really use to help is innovation and, and methods of installation and coordination um, with a congested, very complicated um, system and process. So um, I think that's our biggest opportunity, Mike, in reducing, obviously, cost and timing to launch these facilities. Okay, thank you. 
Um, regarding online battery and EV plants and uh, the different dangers and risks and protocols that are involved, um, we decided we're going to show a few slides so that you can appreciate how it's changed. Uh, it's changed a bit in the construction of an EV plant, the construction of a uh, battery manufacturing plant. Uh, basically, so that you understand, lithium ion plants, um, particles and moisture, so clean room and dry rooms are a very large deal. Okay, the particles and moisture can interfere with the interaction between the anode and cathodes. Told you it was going to be boring. Anodes and cathodes. Okay, um, and if it's a sealed battery and there's moisture in it and or, and or that interaction is not properly proceeding, it could be an extreme situation and an um, ignition and then fire. So uh, I would ask the, the panelists, have you had any of these extreme situations at your operating EV plants? Yes, we, so at, at some of our plants, uh, so when you're talking the battery cells, it takes three millimeters of, of a dent into a cell at, during the assembly process to have a thermal event, right? The training that we provide to all the contractors that come on site are the same training I have to take when I go into a, a battery assembly plant or a battery uh, production facility. So we provide that to all the contractors and, and my rule is you see something, you just leave. You're, you get out of the building, you're not trained to fight it, you're not trained to, to do anything but exit the building. Um, you have to have special training for this. Um, one of the things that we do have is there was a lot of concern, I've wor worked with the locals in Detroit out of Iron Workers Local 25, is explaining that the risk that you're exposed to. So the gases, the, the fumes, what are they? We've gone away from just CO monitors now to use the LTER 5 gas monitoring system similar to what you would use to go in a confined space. Using those gives our people a lot more time and a lot more you know, comfort knowing that they're okay to go back in the building. So once again, we're, we're learning these new technologies. Uh, some of the battery assembly plants, we deal with NMP. Um, so from a VOC standpoint, we also have VOC monitors in certain areas of our battery assembly process. So using the tools and then making sure we're communing, communicating that to the membership is, is really critical for us because once again, we need you to be successful. Gary, how about you? Very, very similar to what, what, what Tony stated. And you know, we're still learning. It's, uh, it's a learning process. The one thing I will say in our, in our battery assembly plants, Rossonville as an example, um, <clears throat> you'll kind of learn as you go. And, and Tony's right. The, the hazards are new to us, those of us that have been in ice for a long time, internal combustion. It, it's a huge learning curve. So uh, we're learning to be very proactive and deal with it. So along with that, on the next slide, we wanted, to, uh, we wanted you to understand what clean is. Now you have to understand, in pharmaceuticals and chip manufacturing, people are familiar with this. But in building auto plants, whether it be the contractor or the crafts that work in them, they aren't necessarily understand it. Now this is exaggerated, that coffee ground, okay, even uh, um, uh, Dunkin' Donuts doesn't use those kind of coffee grounds. But, uh, if you go around that circle, at the very bottom, there's a micron. It's a little tiny dot, and theoretically, that's a comparison proportionately to a coffee ground. Well, in the clean room, they measure half a micron. Your hair, the thickness of your hair is 75 microns. So to give you an idea, in a clean room environment, they're measuring half a micron. Okay, now, if we go to the next slide, what I want, what I want you to understand is there's four protocols. <coughs> Protocol one is a general construction site. Protocol two and three, in two, you're wearing boot coverings. You're wiping down all your tools and, and with uh, alcohol cloths. You're wiping off your hard hat. You have to wear clean clothes. And in a protocol two, craftspeople are working in that environment, okay? Uh, they might be doing, iron workers <coughs> might be doing framing, setting process equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Protocol three is when it really starts getting serious. That's when you're, you're in a completely clean suit, okay? Uh, shoe coverings, uh, uh, hair coverings, beard coverings from facial hair, the whole, the, the, the whole thing, the whole gamut. So those are the protocols, and obviously protocol four, we are not in there. They're actually making batteries, okay? 
Um, on the next slide, just to give you an idea of some of the requirements. <coughs> next slide. Is there a next slide? I think there is. There we go. Okay, so think of a gang box. The inside of the gang box has to be wiped down. The outside of the gang box, all the small tools, everything else, the lifts that are in there, the ladders that are in there, and then it stays in the clean room, okay? But this is what your people are going to be faced with doing, and they have to accept it. They can't complain about it because the battery made there will impact the EV plant when the battery goes to be installed in that fire you saw in, the, in that vehicle. So one of the questions are, many of the, the, the contractors that are used building your EV plants and, and your battery plants, aren't most of them the same contractors that built your, your ice plants, um, et cetera? They have a long history with you? Yes, sir. So their behaviors all have to change. How are they doing with dealing with protocol? Are they, how are they adjusting to protocol, especially two? So we're a little bit further ahead in Kentucky, and 60% um, of the areas are protocol two, and it's been a real struggle, Mike. Um, <clears throat> just general housekeeping um, and setting the expectations. Um, what I'm most concerned about is Thursday or Friday, we go to protocol three and four areas. Um, and Many of our trade partners are concerned with productivity, and this is one of the spots where we really need everyone's help in ensuring productivity is not impacted. Very tight timelines with the installation curve, um, and it, it's, it's a brand new thing to all of us. I, I would ask you, Tony, do you, th I mean, I know you mentioned that you put the crafts through orientation when they come to your sites. Okay, but would it be beneficial if they came with a better understanding of what to expect going to a battery manufacturing plant or an EV plant? I think it would be very important. Um, and I'll mention Local 25 again from Detroit. You know, when, when we started this whole safety process, I went out and I spoke to the, uh, to the apprentice program. So giving you the tools that you need to train your people so that when they come on site, it's not a surprise. And, and we struggle just as much as, as Gary because the way we build the building, we go into production while we're still installing tooling. So it, it's, a, it's a joint area. So I, I fully support providing training to the, to the locals that are gonna that work in our place, in our factories. Do you think it'd be an advantage if the industry ahead of them, uh, the crafts showing up at your site, if the industry got understanding from the auto companies about EV manufacturing plants, about EV or battery manufacturing plants, and develop training so that it could be provided to their membership before they get there. Absolutely. Would, would uh, General Motors, Ford, et cetera, be willing to help that training get developed? Yeah, absolutely. Not paying for it. Don't worry. Not paying for it. That's not what I'm saying. Okay, but 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 at least because you have a start on it, right. you're, you're teaching your workers. Right. Okay, great. That's that's a great follow-up. Okay, now I have one question. By a show of hands, because everybody wants to know where the EV market's going. By a show of hands, how many own an electric vehicle? Everybody, look around the room. No four. <laughs> 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 okay, now diesel doesn't count. So, if you want to know what the issue is, just remember what you saw. Okay? Just remember. And by the way, if a company bought electric vehicles like ours and probably other employers in the room, that doesn't count. Okay? We're just talking about personal vehicles. So, with that said, um, do you, are the OEMs, meaning Ford and General Motors, et cetera, listening to the customer regarding the infamous range anxiety, charging rates, charging infrastructure, and where they're heading in the future, or slowing things down, speeding things up, et cetera? Yeah, and it's, I actually have a case study at home, Mike. Um, my wife refers to her Mach-E as a Miley for Mylocon, you know, the anti-gas for babies? That's the nickname for the car, and um, Oftentimes, I'll bring a story into some of our meetings about the anxiety. So we were strongly encouraged slash forced to lease an e-car 
So of course I've got one and I heard somebody mention a diesel and I'm a Super Duty 6.7 guy so my wife ended up with the car. Well, she chose in February to go see my sister in Traverse City. Very cold, <clears throat> near zero, snowstorm. Turned a three and a half hour trip into an eight hour trip. And oh, by the way, while well, they sat and charged in Grayling and one other area, um, they had to shut the car off completely. Very cold night. And I still catch hell for that, that night. So um, I make sure that that anxiety that my wife felt ultimately landed in my lap that evening and when she returned home, um, that feedback has to be given and we do need to work on range and charging and all the other aspects and challenges of EVs. All right, how about how about you, Tony? I, I would agree. I mean, you know, what General Motors is committed to is we're putting 30,000 charging stations across the, the country in, in both rural areas and in the cities. Um, we've also adopted it for our, anything after a 2025 model will be the North American uh, charging standard. So it's the same adapter that everybody else has used. Um, we have a joint venture with Tesla so that we can use their superchargers. So, you know, by the time we're, we're done, we're thinking there will have access to about 176,000 charging stations across the country. But once again, and this is my personal opinion and not the opinion of General Motors, until we keep plug it in and it takes five to 10 minutes, that will sell vehicles. I'm just curious, you haven't bought your wife an EV yet? Like, no, Gary, no. Okay. no, but she is a candidate, so that's... Okay. But by the way, I'm willing to loan it to you for a weekend. <laughs> you could do that. <laughs> I think she'd probably want the Corvette E-Ray. <laughs> okay, so what does the current path look like between ICE, okay, internal combustion engines, and EVs? Is a hybrid a solution, or where is it all, is it getting traction? Where is it heading? So in automotive news just recently, Mary Barra, our CEO, talked about, you know, every option's on the table. With the range anxiety, looking at, at, at the hybrids, looking at EVs, I mean, we are committed at General Motors for, for our zero congestion, zero con uh, emissions, and zero crashes. So, I mean, we are still committed to EVs. We're putting out 30 EVs before 2030. Uh, we've got 11 coming out this year, so, but we also have new ICE vehicles coming out too. So it's, it's a balance right now, um, and I think that every option is on the table, but especially with the volatility, right? We slowed down Orion. We want to get the product right. We want to make sure that we're addressing the, the range anxiety, and we want to get it right the first time. How about you, Gary? Yeah, very similar to Tony's. We've, um, hybrid has really made a surge. We're up about 118% year over year on the Maverick. And um, we're, our goal is to double the F-150 hybrid this year to 20 JPH. And the, the good news there is at Dearborn, we um, share common facilities for body and paint and have a separate final. So we designed the plant to be able to flex between ICE and uh, EV, which has been very fortunate. What we're working on now is once we get to the 20, percent, how do we increase further with hybrids? Because um, I'm sure if we asked for a show of hand of hybrids, you'd see a <clears throat> influx upward of hybrids. Well, you'd have to see more than two. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, if EV production is, I don't want to say use the term, it's slowed, if it slows down a little bit, and ice and hybrids especially pick up, what will be the effect on battery manufacturing plants? Will that impact that, or is that, is that ship still sailing? I think that ship's still sailing. We're, we're, we're full steam ahead with our battery assembly plans, our battery uh, production facilities. So I, I don't see that impacting, I mean, our commitment to EVs. Yeah. So we, we did make an adjustment, as noted, in October of 23. So Kentucky, too, we've got two plants going up uh, roughly eight months behind one another. Um, as we announced, we're going to do the core and shell and postpone tooling. I uh, haven't given a period of time, but to, to match the demand, Mike, we've slowed Kentucky 2 down. And uh, we'll look at the future, what we do there. Okay, another question. Where, where are the like EV motors and the other EV components uh, manufactured? I mean, will the existing ICE powertrain plants be part of the solution for some of those parts to be made and need to be retooled, et cetera? So at, at Ford, we did, um, so Van Dyke Transmission is now a 
the Van Dyke Electrical Vehicle Center. We actually do e-motors and e-drives there. And then at Livonia Transmission, which is still Livonia Transmission, we make uh, gears as well as Sharonville Transmission in Ohio. So we have shifted to EV components in those facilities. Tony, how about and, you? And we've done the same. Lockport, New York is our e-motors. Um, St. Catharines in, in Canada is, is doing some. Toledo is a, a, a combination of both Flynn engine. I mean, so we are still, what we're doing is, you know, we had a lot of buildings that have, have been converted or we walked away from that we're putting new tooling in. So we're taking brownfield sites and making them now um, e-motors and, and for the electric vehicles. So we're using what we have. So kind of contrary to the press, and what they published, the, the um, shuttering of powertrain plants is not really happening. They're being repurposed, which obviously at, uh, you know, involves retooling and rehab and et cetera, et cetera. So that, that's, all a, that's all a good thing. Um, has the iron worker craft and or its employers impeded the growth of your business? Or, they, or would you look at it that they've assisted it and supported it? I would say uh, assisted. I mean, they've, they've done nothing to impede it at all, right? They, they show up on our work sites and they're ready to work. Yeah, and I, I would agree. I've actually um, gotten to know a few of them in uh, Elizabethtown, Kentucky. There's a local watering hole where four or five of the gentlemen hang out at night and <laughs> happens to be where I like to hang out. So. Uh, it's good to share stories at night. They've been a huge help, right? I mean, as I mentioned, near record levels of timing for just the building erection itself. I thought you were gonna tell me it's a local Baptist church that, that everybody. There may be one, Mike, but I don't you, frequent it. You haven't found it yet? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So um, what are the questions from the audience? I mean, we still have several minutes left. Um, what questions do you have for these gentlemen? I guess one thing, Mike, I'd like to add before there are any questions. So for us in both Glendale and Stanton, both very rural, rural areas, um, and I'll just use Glendale as the example, right? The, the, the government, both county and state, cannot get the arteries in from a traffic and flow perspective fast enough. Um, you'd be shocked at the amount of safety and other legal issues we've had with behaviors, um, but not just your craft, all crafts. And we had a significant event in Glendale last week where actually four people were arrested because of some of the behaviors. It's taken 45 minutes to an hour to get into both facilities. Um, and I personally have been focused in Tennessee with the local, the county, because they've got jurisdiction over the roads that we have for the art arteries where we have Mike's team building. And um, I, I really am concerned on the safety impact. Anytime you're backing up freeways, which we're doing in, in both cases, um, you can't react fast enough. The state has done a hell of a good job, but unfortunately we're losing 30 to 45 minutes of productivity almost daily in those sites. So the one thing that would be good to get help on is communication. We try to be proactive in communicating, but um, like we hear and see in the news, there's a lot of hostility um, with traffic issues on both sides. Thank you, Gary. I have a question. I'm working on the battery plant for in Marshall. Would it, in the interest of keeping the safe workforce there, would it be better if we were to try to get that I'll let you start, Mike, and then I'll... I'll okay, I was going to mention a number of the trade partners. Um, in fact, ironically, the same structural erector, okay, is at, is at that site also, and a number of the other trade partners. Um, the, we will look at providing additional training and additional information because the clean rooms are not bid yet. But the plan is, is to provide early to the crafts make available, the ideal situation would be a video that they could watch on the internet and understand what it's about, okay? And then do, it, do something similar or a little built more detail when they come to the site. 
the, the, the uh, clean room trade contractors are still being built or being bid and proposed on, so that's not solidified yet. But our lessons learned, both from um, our lessons from Tennessee and sharing with Ford the lessons that Barton and Mallow has learned in, in Kentucky, hopefully will be inserted into those bid packages so every time we're getting just a little bit better. But the big thing is, it's one thing, you develop it, you got to communicate it. And the communication of it is so important. You can't hold a person accountable unless you tell them what the rules are. It's like with your, with your own, I'm sure, with your own children. Okay, so your point is very well taken. No, I appreciate the question and the input and my counterpart, Dave Nowicki, who I actually had a similar conversation with this morning on Marshall. Make sure that we do our part in being proactive with your team and anything that we enhance, we do it real time together versus um, learning the hard way. How about anybody else? Just. It, it has been more of an issue in Kentucky than Tennessee. Um, the prime contractor in, in Kentucky, and we replicated in Tennessee, chose to have a third party do the application for the biocide that we're using there. So obviously a sensitive topic, but we, we I should say, ABLE in Kentucky and state in uh, Tennessee has been very proactive in regards to treatment. The containers in Tennessee are far less in numbers than uh, what we're seeing in Kentucky. Yes, Kevin. What do you think the auto industry looks like in five to 10 years? You know, you've got a huge Chinese electric vehicle manufacturer. I read yesterday they want to build a plant in Mexico to circumvent, you know, the trade policies, you know, are the players going to be the same? Do you see a change, fundamental change in the market? What's your opinion? <laughs> well, in, in our most recent visit to, to Mexico, as you know, we have a couple of active plants down there, one where we build the, the Maverick. The Chinese now have 26% of the share in Mexico. I believe it was up from 9% the year prior, so the growth rate has never been seen before. Um, I, I personally think, similar to what we, we alluded to and talked about, in the immediate <clears throat> to short term, we need to adapt to the hybrid market. Where we go from there, there's future technologies that both teams are working on that, similar to battery, I, I think we're still a ways out um, to, to really see consumer demand. So I, I personally think hybrid is where we need to focus. Yes, sir. So, given the, all, all the hydrogen hubs and the investment that's coming, do you see a hydrogen operated vehicle as the, the next generation of, uh, you know, coupling on Kevin's question? Is that probably the next evolution? You want that one? I, I think it's on the table. Yeah. I, I don't think there's anything that's off the table right now, right? The battery market is very volatile. Uh, technology changes. I was just talking to my, my kids the other day about, you know, I remember having a bag phone, right? Now we carry around computers. So it's changing so much that I can't see that not being an option. I know as uh, three or four years ago, we were building battery, excuse me, hydrogen test labs at both their facilities. And that was three or four years ago. Um, and also we were involved with that with another uh, auto OEM. So hydrogen is, Definitely one of the items in play. Solid state batteries, which is a game changer. Okay, much longer uh, range, uh, much quicker charge. That's not too far in the distant future, meaning two or three years away. So um, it's gonna change rapidly. As far, as far as who the players are, no one knows, Kevin, who the players are gonna be. Um, could be consolidation, um, no one knows. Definitely consolidation, I think, is inevitable for um, R&D development. Um, I think you're going to see that happen in the future um, because of the cost that that, that incurs. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, 
it's a time to hold on and pray. When you move to the next gen battery, the solid state battery, does it allow for, do you have to build a plan? They'll, they'll be changed over. It's very similar to what we see in the ice or internal combustion side, Kevin. And you can imagine, one of the things is, if you were chain, doing a changeover in a battery manufacturing plant and they were still making batteries, think about what your, how your behaviors would have to be so different. It's not going in and just hacking and slashing, right? <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's a whole different ballgame. And that's why this change of behaviors is important because it's never existed to this extent in our industry. Again, pharmaceuticals it has, and chip plants it has. But also, they didn't have the seriousness. You saw that vehicle fire. They don't have that issue. Other questions? Uh-oh, they got the hook on us. <laughs> so thank you very much for your time. It was an honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you.